From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Anne-Marie Hordern, I'm Joe Matthew. All eyes on the White House and Capitol Hill ahead of tomorrow's meeting between the president and the four highest ranking members of Congress. As Mitch McConnell warns Bloomberg, he doesn't have a, quote, secret little plan. We'll speak with former assistant Treasury Secretary for Economic Policy, Ben Harris. And the other major story impacting this week, the expiration of Title 42 and the expected influx of migrants at our southern border, with Congress now taking another swing at reform. We're joined by Congressman Mike Gallagher, chair of the Select Committee on China, a member of the House Armed Services Committee this hour. And bad news for President Biden. New polling shows he's trailing both former President Trump and Governor Ron DeSantis nationally. Joe, happy Monday. Welcome back. Uh, what a bruising poll for the president over the weekend, especially as he heads into this high stakes meeting. Yeah, new numbers from ABC News and Washington Post, not the direction no. that this White House wants to see. This is only two weeks after announcing his reelection campaign and the lowest approval numbers in record on that poll. Yeah, and what's so interesting is he's not doing well in terms of the economy, yet we have an unemployment rate that's the lowest since 1969. That's and right. Potentially, things can get a little bit more angsty here when it comes to financial sector and the economy in Washington. You can probably bet on that, yes, yeah. especially with this week ahead. Yeah, so tomorrow is what we're all looking forward to. And as we talk about this uh, jam-packed week ahead in politics, joining us around the table to discuss Bloomberg's Kate Davidson and Mario Parker. So let's start with the first agenda item on that calendar tomorrow, debt ceiling meeting. Um, Battle lines, Kate, have seemed to be drawn harder. We had this uh, letter from Republicans over the weekend, and then we had Mitch McConnell saying they're assuming there's some little secret plan here. The White House and the Speaker's teams need to sit down now and settle it. Can Kevin McCarthy and Joe Biden at least come to some form of an agreement that they see a path forward to avoid a default? I mean, I think we should keep our expectations low, right, <laughs> um, for this particular meeting. I don't think anyone is expecting a big breakthrough. Um, I think, you know, both sides, sure, they don't want to be dealing with this. I don't think anyone enjoys having these debt ceiling fights. They want to come to some resolution. Um, but it does seem, as you said, Amory, that both sides are, are pretty in, entrenched, right? And I think that the biggest issue is that the president says he doesn't want these things to be coupled together, uh, spending cuts and a debt ceiling increase. He's adamant that, look, we authorize legislation to um, spend this money, and um, this is like paying the credit card bill. You know, mm -hmm. we have to pay what we what we owe. Um, and if we want to have a conversation um, about fiscal responsibility um, or, or whatever, you know, Republicans are, are proposing spending cuts and reforms, that that should be separate. And obviously, that's just not Kevin McCarthy is is miles from that that position. Mm -hmm. So they they will they come a little bit closer together, hopefully. But I think again, expectations are low. So, Mario, this is Joe Biden's terrible, horrible, not good, very bad week, as we uh, <laughs> have been discussing here. I mean, every day there's another potential risk politically beginning with this meeting tomorrow. So my question is, you know, how do both of these guys come out of this looking like they got something tomorrow? Because that's the essence of compromise, right? Kevin McCarthy's going to go into the White House driveway after that meeting, and he's going to give his version of what happened. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden's going to have a readout at some point. You can read the email. But how do both find something to lead to another meeting? Well, this is the initial, this is the initial matchup, right? And for for our uh, uh, boxing aficionados, this is that press <laughs> conference where the two fighters this come and they stare at each other for a second. <laughs> That's essentially what tomorrow is. There, there may not be any punches thrown. Mm -hmm. uh, both sides will come out at least signaling to their bases that they went in and they 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 talked about their stances. I mean, the White House is already already signaling with a week ahead agenda. President Biden's going up to the Hudson Valley in mm -hmm. New York. Mm. to talk about the debt ceiling and Republicans' platform. This is ahead of the meeting tomorrow. So this kind of lets you know he's sending a signal to both Republicans and his party alike that he's not going into the meeting thinking about budging. But the issue is, and that's a great analogy, you know, the boxers are basically only just coming out now, but the issue is, Kate, the timeline. We are less than a month away. Mm -hmm. Should this opening act have happened 
I don't know, at least two weeks ago, how mm. concerned are the financial markets? I mean, if you look at actually the short-term treasury market, yeah. they are concerned. They're starting to get concerned. That's right. And we know, you know, it, it's typical um, Congress, you know, lawmakers, folks in Washington, they don't tend to pay attention or really make progress until markets start to freak out a little bit. I don't think anyone's freaking out. But right, we're seeing this in treasury auctions. We're seeing this on the yield um, uh, on, on T-bills and these auctions in recent days um, that have gone up extremely high. I think one last week from one-month T-bills. So those maturing at the beginning of June when we, you know, expect that, that uh, if there's not a, a, a resolution, we could potentially default. Those uh, spiked to the highest rate, I, th- I think it was um, ever, and the highest for any Treasury auction since 2000. So, I mean, that means something. That's meaningful. So investors are getting nervous, and, and hopefully folks, you know, on the Hill are paying attention. And marie you mentioned uh, our interview with Mitch McConnell today. Bloomberg's Stephen Dennis sat down with him in his yeah. office. No secret plan. He's basically <laughs> saying, don't look at me, because yeah. a lot of the narrative last week was it's just a matter of time before Mitch McConnell uh, decides to come to the rescue here. We spoke earlier on Bloomberg TV with Senator Bill Cassidy, Republican from Louisiana. Here's what he said. The only person he needs to meet with is Kevin McCarthy. And having McConnell there in Schumer is merely window dressing. The president needs to engage in the political reality of McCarthy's ability to lead that house. The president needs to show leadership. Not just say, I want it exactly the way I want it, mm. and I will talk to you otherwise. I, I am curious. That's so- not leadership. Mario Mitch McConnell, window dressing in this meeting. Yeah. Does he sit quietly in the cabinet room tomorrow? It looks to be that way, right? We know that Joe Biden likes to talk about, invoke the days of yesteryear, right? But the <laughs> Mitch McConnell from 2011 <laughs> is not walking through the Oval Office doors tomorrow. And no? He's sending that message to the White House Quite clearly, Mitch McConnell is a gamer. He understands that Republicans have the upper hand right now. He doesn't want to undercut uh, Kevin McCarthy at this point also as well. Time is ticking, as Kate mentioned, but as of right now, McConnell is putting the onus on President Biden to make that deal without leaning on their relationship. You mentioned yesteryear. Yester years. Uh, the president this weekend suffered a really terrible blow in this poll, the lowest approval rating of his career. And also, very concerning, Americans are, when you look at, I think it was a little bit over a 1,000 individuals they mm-hmm. have for this poll, but majority are concerned with his age. You talk about yesteryears. They're concerned that he is not up for the task in 2024. Is this just going to get louder? This will get louder, and this will be a Republican talking point. You saw Nikki Haley, a presidential uh, contender, uh, mentioning it in kind of rather frankly, crass terms uh, a couple of weeks back. But this will be an issue, and this is setting the stage for Republicans to essentially make this a, while Democrats are trying to make this a referendum, at least if based off the polls we have now with Trump, between two presidents, Republicans want to make this a referendum between a president, a past president, and the vice president in Kamala Harris as well. So they would like to make her a bigger issue in this election going forward. But, I mean, make no mistake about it, the series of gaffes that we've seen over the last two or two, or two and a half years while he's been in office kind of taking a toll on the president's numbers. We're going to get into the methodology of that poll a little bit more later on uh, with our political panel. But, Mario, if you, if you pull out here, <laughs> Donald Trump's four years younger than Joe Biden which is not very much. And I think it was 43% of this poll said they thought both were too old. Doesn't that give yeah. Joe Biden a little cover there to say, hey, I don't know, why don't you ask the guy at Mar-a-Lago about being old? I'm doing the job. It, it does, because right now, pre- former President Trump wa- wants to employ, like, uh, uh, essentially, like, amnesia in the fourth year of his presidency, <laughs> which uh, saw us fall into a recession, COVID, et cetera. But, yeah, the age thing, in terms of, I mean, there's a four-year difference. We do have two, uh, two, two men older than 70 uh, mm-hmm. uh, running for the presidency right now. Uh, at the same time, in the Republican primary, you got somebody like Ron DeSantis that's trying to make President Trump's age a thing yeah, as well. Right. The other uh, big uh, tidbit from this poll is about the economy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trump, the former president, is having done better of handling the job of the economy when he was president than Biden has done so far this term. I mentioned the unemployment rate. Obviously, inflation continues to dog this administration. Is that just it? People feel like they have less money in their pockets? 
I think that that has to be a huge part of it. You know, these these kinds of polls have been puzzling for a while when you look at, like you said, Anne-Marie, just the astounding recovery in the labor market. I mean, it's really incredible that on so many metrics, we're back to where we were before the pandemic. And on some metrics, we're better than we've ever been. I mean, women's employment to population ratio, I think, was the highest ever. Um, and th those, are, those are not small things. I mean, those are big victories for this administration. And it's really what they said that they were setting out to do um, when they came in. Uh, in 2021, and um, there was a COVID resurgence. Remember in December, and that, and um, you know, the economy lost jobs in that December, right before President Biden was inaugurated. So there has been a very rapid recovery, but that's come obviously with historic inflation. And so, right it, as you said, it just it continues to dog them. And I think that consumers are still just feeling like things are not that great. The other uh, potentially tough day for Joe Biden is Thursday, of course, yeah. as we discussed already, lifting Title 42 restrictions uh, at the border. The Texas governor, Greg Abbott, made remarks at the Austin International Airport earlier today about the troops the administration is sending south. The 1,500 troops the president just announced he's sending to the border, they're doing paperwork. They're not going to actually be on the border trying to secure the border. The idea, though, while that is true, is that they would free up the Border Patrol to do what they need to do at the border. Uh, the administration, Mario, has got to be bracing for some very difficult optics starting on Thursday. I believe it was Lindsey Graham who said all hell breaks loose. There, there's no doubt about it. Again, as you, you saw there, the White House is surging 1,500 troops there. Yeah. Uh, Kirsten Cinema, who is... Not shy about criticizing this White House this past weekend. You saw her saying that they haven't done enough there. The president is even drawing some friendly fire from Democrats, particularly yeah. Democrats of big city uh, that, that oversee big cities as well. Alejandro Mayorkas, though, says we've been working for a year and a half to prepare. We're ready. Yeah. yeah and, and what you're going to see here now, I mean, again, this is going to be an issue that's going to play really well really to the Republicans' favor in the election. The Biden administration is essentially ripping the Band-Aid off, mm. uh, what, 18 months before 2024 on this and trying to figure out something to do. Mario, thank you. Mario Parker with us along with Bloomberg's Kate Davidson talking through the big stories of the day here and coming up less than 24 hours until the meeting between President Biden and congressional leaders over the debt ceiling. Former Assistant Treasury Secretary Ben Harris will be with us. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. The crucial moment is arriving here. President Biden, Speaker Kevin McCarthy, finally sitting down tomorrow, of course, along with other congressional leaders, to open talks on raising the debt ceiling. And you thought they were already open. Twelve <laughs> days now after McCarthy passed his bill through the House. And, of course, the question is, will it create yet another standoff or yield a breakthrough? Joining us is former Assistant Treasury Secretary Ben Harris, it's great to have you at the table. Thank you for coming in. Sure. This would be one of the moments that you're glad to not still be at the <laughs> Treasury, I'm guessing. But if you were there now and you're gaming this out ahead of this important meeting tomorrow, should people expect progress? I feel like there's an expectation that more is going to happen here than is likely. Yeah, so I have to say, anytime I talk about the debt ceiling, I think the key point is this meeting should never be happening in the first place. Fair enough. You know, the debt ceiling has been raised 80 times going back to 1960. There's almost never, ever negotiations around this. It was raised three times during the Trump administration. House Republicans never complained then. They passed it with plenty of votes. So this is pretty unique, what's happening, that you're seeing all of this political turmoil yeah. around the debt ceiling. But as far as what people can expect, you know, both sides are pretty dug in here. And to a lot of people in the American public, it doesn't matter whether or not they should be having the meeting or not. They're just worried about what's going on in financial markets. They're worried about the consequences for their 401k. And so, you know, I think we'll be watching to see how progress comes out of this meeting, but I wouldn't expect too much. I understand the White House thinks that they shouldn't have to negotiate over this, and it should be a clean raise. But at the end of the day, they did say, show me your plan. McCarthy was able to get something through Congress. His caucus will not pass a clean raise. They will not do it. So if that's the case, what's the strategy? Well, so I think right now the position is they won't pass a clean raise. We know from Secretary Yellen that it looks like we'll see an X date sometime in the first two weeks in June. But, you know, both sides have a plan. President Biden has a $3 trillion plan to reduce the deficit. House Republicans have a $4.8 trillion 
plan to reduce the deficit, it's very appropriate to have discussions around what to do around you know, not having enough revenue and having maybe too much spending, but you shouldn't do it with a gun to your head and potential financial turmoil a few weeks away. There's been talk about a lot of creative options here. We love getting into the idea of a trillion dollar coin. I'm pretty sure the Treasury Secretary is done with that conversation. But there also have been questions as well about some some other opportunities, including the 14th Amendment that the president might have. Let's listen to the Treasury Secretary talking about this on ABC's This Week. All I want to say is that it's Congress's job to do this. If they fail to do it, we will have an economic and financial catastrophe that will be of our own making. And um, there is no action that President Biden uh, and the U.S. Treasury can take to prevent that uh, catastrophe. To be clear, though, Ben, I'm assuming everything is actually on the table right now. It would be foolish to remove any option if this does come to an 11th hour decision. Yeah, I think you're right. So to my understanding is that nothing's been taken off the table. I hear a lot of people talking about the 14th Amendment. There's mm -hmm. a lot of excitement because it seems like it's a fairly easy resolution to this problem. Yeah. The reason why it's not all that appealing is because it doesn't really solve the problem in that it won't necessarily calm financial markets. I mean, if you're an investor, do you want to go ahead and buy treasuries <laughs> under this cloud of legal uncertainty? Fair enough. And so it doesn't necessarily solve the problem, which is why I think you're seeing some aversion to that coming mm -hmm. out of the Biden administration. The X date is June 1st. Many people thought actually it was going to be potentially later in the summer going into the fall. How did she get to that X date? Because people think potentially Secretary Yellen was being more conservative. But isn't this done just through technocrats? Yeah, you're exactly right. And so I bristle a little bit. I, I spent two and a half years at Janet Yellen's side. I got to know her really well. This is the most credible person you'll, you'll ever meet. If she says the X date is somewhere between June 1st and mid-June, you can take that to the bank. Mm. And the people who are making these projections at Treasury, I have no idea what political party they belong to. These are true career servants. They just look at the numbers, they report it back to Secretary Yellen, and then she turns to the public and says what she, what she hears. So it is right to say that a lot of this conversation right now is very political, but when it comes to the X date and what Secretary Yellen is communicating, there's no politics to that at all. There's no politics uh, to that process, but when we say the 1st of June, you know, the real language is as early as the 1st of June, right? Yeah. Can people can assume that there's a couple of weeks to play there? Exactly. So if you look at the language of the letter, mm -hmm. and this is a former Fed chair who knows the importance of language. Language yes. matters to Janet Yellen. Right. And she said it could come as early as June 1st, and, uh, but likely sometime in early June. Now, there isn't any sort of hard and fast definition of what early June means. My interpretation was around June 14th or June 15th. Uh, and so, you know, I think you can think the first half of June is really the time. Is there mm -hmm. any other wiggle room? What if the X date ends up being on a Monday or a Friday? How different could that change, depending on when Social Security checks go out, when certain debt payments need to be made? Yeah, so if there was wiggle room, she would have said that in the letter. So when you look at the extraordinary measures, they've, most of them have been taken. Mm -hmm. There was a letter that went out in January from the Treasury Department where we said, and I said we because I was there at the time, we noted at the end of June there was a one-time opportunity for about $140 billion extraordinary measure uh, through the federal pension system. Uh, the days matter when it comes to the X day. I think this is underappreciated a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if it can fall you know, on, uh, say, I don't know, June 9th, versus June 25th, those days are arbitrary, but those days really matter. And you, know, you brought up Social Security payments. Well, Social Security payments are typically made on the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of a month. Now, in June, it falls on, I think, June 14th is the first big Social Security payment. So the relationship to that payment probably matters, given the importance of Social Security from a political perspective. Wow. Another date to circle in your calendar. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Our thanks so much to former Treasury official Ben Harris, also is the former chief economist at the Treasury Department. Coming up, the key reports from the Fed today show the tightening of credit in the U.S. economy and the risks around it. Kay Lines will have the details. This is Balance Power on Bloomberg TV. The truth of the matter is that if those banks, the regional banks and mid-sized banks and community banks are not uh, financing local real estate, commercial real estate transactions, 
they won't get financed. The role of these banks in the U.S. economy is so um, high that people actually, frankly, underestimate what these banks mean for our financial ecosystem. The former FDIC chair speaking on Bloomberg TV earlier today about the important role of smaller banks in the economy. This is new Fed data shows banks are tightening loan standards. Bloomberg Kaylee Lyons is here with more. So, Kaylee, things are just getting a little bit tougher in this smaller banking sector. Right. And that's kind of what we expected after the failures we have seen, that we were going to see a material right. tightening in lending standards on the part of banks. And we all been, had been waiting for the senior loan officer survey data that the Fed released today, which did show... That tightening is happening. About 46 percent of banks now uh, say they are tightening terms on commercial and industrial loans for medium and large businesses. And perhaps even more tellingly, 55 percent expect to keep tightening standards over the remainder of this year. Another interesting stat in this is that the proportion of banks reporting stronger demand for these kind of loans dropped 55.6 percent. That is the biggest drop since 2009, so it does speak to kind of a softening in the economy that we are seeing. I would note as well that this kind of lines up with separate data released by Goldman Sachs last, last week as part of their survey of 10,000 small businesses. They found 77 percent of small business owners are reporting they are concerned about their ability to access capital. To put that in contrast from a year ago, 77 percent said they were confident in their ability to access capital. So this is a story that has changed very quickly. And I would note that this isn't just in, in regard to businesses. Consumers are seeing uh, lending standards tighten as well for things like credit cards or auto loans. And all of this is something that the Fed addressed in a separate report in its financial stability report that it released uh, just a few hours ago, talking about how a sharp contraction in the availability of credit would drive up the cost of funding for businesses and households and potentially, potentially result in a slowdown in economic activity. So do we have expectations going into the, the Fed data today to gauge whether this is good news or or better than expected somehow, or it's just all bad? I guess they could have tightened more aggressively, yeah. right? So in some sense, this is actually moderate. But you also have to layer on uh, the fact that we have to contend with the debt ceiling, for example, uh, and that could lead to even further tightening. And actually, in that financial stability report, the New York Fed conducted a survey of different market watchers and participants about risks they see in the next 12 to 18 months. They talked about the debt limit. That was actually number six mm -hmm. in terms of the most cited risk. And they quoted that respondents saw the potential for funding market disruptions, tighter financial conditions, if the debt limit is not raised in a timely manner. Also noting adverse ramifications of a technical or outright default, including a sharp rise in Treasury yields, an increase in corporate financing costs, and a deterioration in risk sentiment. So from a, from a broader financial stability perspective, it's not just about those credit conditions and what banks are doing. It's about whether the U.S. is paying its debts as well. Sounds like the politics is almost doing the Fed's job for Jay Powell. Well, it's a good point because the Fed does want some of this to happen, right? This is the whole point of higher interest rates is to kind of slow down the economy through this transmission mechanism. It's just a question of whether it becomes too much all yeah. at once. And we've all heard so many people talking about the catastrophic economic consequences of a potential default. Janet Yellen among them. That's right. It could be a little too much help, depending on <laughs> how that goes. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines, thanks as ever. Coming up, U.S. Ambassador to China, Nicholas Burns, meeting with the Chinese Foreign Minister earlier today in Beijing. Republican Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin joins us next on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Anne-Marie Hordern. U.S. Ambassador Nick Burns meeting with Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Gong earlier today discussing the challenges in the two countries' relationship and how to mend ties potentially. This is the highest level meeting in weeks between these two superpowers. Republican Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin joins us. He chairs the House Select Committee on China. And I welcome you, Mr. Chairman, to Bloomberg TV and on Balance of Power here. The director of national intelligence, if I could just start with something that's uh, in the news today, uh, told a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing that China and Russia would likely seek to exploit a credit default were that to happen here in the U.S. Do you agree with that? And what would China try to do? Well, I've seen none of the underlying intelligence that the director of national intelligence would base that on. I'd be shocked if she and Putin were discussing the de details in that way. There's no doubt that both countries would like to see America continue on this path of profligacy. They would like us to see us bankrupt ourselves, And so 
My hope is that we can find a way to solve this debt crisis. It's not going to be a clean debt ceiling increase. It's going to involve some common sense reforms. And I do think it's true at a broader level, and perhaps this is what the DNI was referring to, that no nation in history has been able to maintain its international power if it failed to get its fiscal house in order. So that's what we need to do. Our, our military strength is, of course, intimately connected with our economic strength and continuing to bankrupt the country, continuing out of control, reckless spending is simply not a formula for geopolitical success over the long term. What do you make right now of the communication or the lack of communication between Washington and Beijing? We have, of course, U.S. Ambassador Nick Byrne seeing uh, the foreign minister of China. But at the same time, Secretary Yellen, Secretary Blinken, um, even now we have reporting that Lloyd Austin is trying to meet his counterpart, yet no meetings have been scheduled. Well, I, I think it's really a fool's errand for us to be chasing CCP officials around the world in an attempt to get a meeting. We've tried for years, even going back to the Trump administration, to establish a crisis communication hotline, which makes a lot of sense. You want to avoid miscalculation, particularly if a crisis heats up over the Taiwan Strait. But the Chinese Communist Party continues to rebuff the advances of the Biden administration. And so rather than trying to send our officials there, we should demand that the CCP come to the United States for any future meeting. And after all, it's they who um, sent a, a spy balloon uh, to drift over the continental United States. It's the CCP who is threatening peace and stability and the status quo across the Taiwan Strait. And of course, it's the CCP which continues to steal our intellectual property theft and commit genocide. So I'm not optimistic, in other words, that any meeting right now will improve bilateral relations. I think wisdom lies in us improving our deterrent posture across the Taiwan mm -hmm. Strait and communicating in clear terms that we will not stand idly by while the CCP continues to increase its aggression internationally. Mr. Chairman, coming out of that meeting uh, with our ambassador, China's foreign minister said, quote, the top priority is to avoid a downward spiral and prevent accidents between China and the U.S. But isn't it China that's been pushing the boundaries when it comes to rules of engagement? That's 100 percent right. And, and this really goes back prior to Xi Jinping goes back to at least 2009 when the CCP started to make expansive claims of sovereignty throughout the South China Sea and started to turbocharge its island building campaign. Uh, it started to really implement its anti-axis aerial deny capability. And since then, what have we seen? In addition to a horrific human rights record, genocide in Xinjiang province, we've seen effectively economic warfare waged against the industrial Midwest. We've, of course, seen um, cognitive warfare wage against Taiwan. That's the biggest thing that President Tsai told us when she came to California to meet with the speaker, myself and a bipartisan group uh, of members. It's a CCP that's bent on upending the status quo. Uh, it's a CCP that continues to grow more aggressive. And it's time for us to stand united with our partners and allies against this aggression, because it's not just a distant over their problem. As the spy balloon incident, as well as the illegal CCP police stations on American soil illustrate, it's a right here at home problem. Uh, Representative, you also recently sent a letter to Nike and Adidas. You mentioned the Uyghurs. Uh, you are looking into Nike and Adidas and whether or not they used forced labor in China. Have you had a response yet from these companies? Not yet, unless something came uh, in today that I was not notified of. But um, our concern really is that these companies aren't complying with the intent of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. In particular, we want to make sure that no company is taking advantage of the so-called de minimis uh, loophole uh, in the bill. Uh, researchers in Germany recently tested Adidas clothing and determined that garments were made with cotton from the Xinjiang region. These allegations were reinforced in written testimony for our committee's March hearing on the ongoing genocide. And of course, previous studies have linked the production of Adidas products to forced labor by Uyghurs. So we just want to make sure that these companies are complying with the overwhelmingly bipartisan Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. And I think every American consumer, even those who want cheap textiles, want to have some assurances that their clothes aren't being made with slave labor in Xinjiang province. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I want to ask you about what's happening at the border and what's happening here in Washington uh, in reaction to that. Of course, Title 42 restrictions lift on Thursday. The House uh, Republican majority is up with legislation this week uh, to deal with the border. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre earlier today at the White House uh, weighed in on this. Listen. House Republicans are more interested in campaigning on immigration than actually solving it. 
The bill, H.R. 2, would be a disaster for border security and a Christmas morning gift for human smugglers. If the president were presented with H.R. 2, he would veto it. He won't let House Republicans make things worse despite, despite their best efforts. So he will veto H.R. 2 is the word from the White House today. Mr. Chairman, what's going to happen on the border on Thursday? Well, that type of rhetoric really, I think, is um, is unfortunate. I mean, you just saw the White House press secretary just say a bunch of talking points. Um, I, you know, I, I, listen, we need cooler heads to prevail here. What we have here is obviously a disaster on the southern border. Uh, we should be able to retain Title II, Title 42 authority to give our officials on the southern border the tools that they need to deal with this crisis. We need to get back to, um, you know, a defense in depth by allowing asylum claims to be adjudicated in countries in Central America and Mexico prior to people coming to the southern border itself. We need to be using the best cutting edge technology. We have some incredible uh, companies using AI technology and advanced towers to get to those parts of the border that are more rural and not as urban and densely populated. So this is what makes this so frustrating. And I say this as someone who spent some time when I was in uniform at the southern border uh, in, a, in a fellowship with DEA. This is such a mm -hmm. solvable problem, right? This isn't, we have the technology, what we lack is the willpower, and we need people to come together just to fix the border. We don't want people to come here illegally. We want people to come here legally in a transparent system. We need to end this crisis. Congressman, thank you so much for your time today. Republican Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin, of course, also the chair of the China Select Committee. Mm. Uh, interesting, though, Secretary Mayorkas, to your point, said they're mm -hmm. prepared. They said they've been working on it for a year and a half, so let's see what happens yeah, on Thursday. we'll huh? have to see. Thursday, mm -hmm. a big week for this White House and this president. Coming up, we'll discuss one of those big topics, the red-hot debate over the debt ceiling and how tomorrow's meeting at the White House will play out. From Washington, this is Balance of Power. Now, keeping up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm John Hyland. Near Dallas, Texas, investigators are looking into whether the man who killed eight people at a shopping mall was interested in white supremacist ideology. The 33-year-old was killed by police officers in the mall's parking lot. Witnesses say he was wearing a tactical vest that was jammed with ammunition. President Biden says his administration is proposing a new compensation rule airlines must follow if flights are delayed or canceled. The new rules will also seek to force airlines to improve the availability of customer service during periods of widespread flight delays or cancellations. Warren Buffett says he prefers deploying capital in Japan instead of Taiwan. At Berkshire Hathaway's annual meeting over the weekend, Buffett lamented the geopolitics that led to his firm cutting its stake in Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing. He called it one of the best managed and most important companies in the world. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Originals. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Hyland, and this is Bloomberg. We should not have House Republicans manufacturing a crisis on something that has been done 78 times since 1960. This is their constitutional duty. Congress must act. That's what the president's going to make very clear uh, with, uh, with the leaders tomorrow. Uh, Congress must avoid default without conditions. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. That was, of course, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre speaking on the debt ceiling earlier today. Here to discuss is our political panel, Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University, and Lester Munson, BGR government affairs partner. Jeannie, I want to start with you. Uh, it seems like the Republican Party's line has gotten even stronger over the weekend. We had these 43 Senate Republicans coming out saying they're not going to pass a cloture for a clean debt ceiling bill. And then we had leader Mitch McConnell on the Republican side say, I don't have a secret plan. The speaker needs to negotiate with the president. Is he correct? 
Well, that's what we're hearing. And, you know, in one hand, I don't think it's surprising. Usually at these first meetings, historically, everybody gets dug in on their position. The hope, of course, is they find a way that everybody can win or everybody can lose a little and come to some center. But I think the McConnell piece is so important and the piece on the Bloomberg is so telling because the Democrats, I believe, have been hoping for a long time that Mitch McConnell would ride back to the rescue. And he is stating very clearly, at least at this point, he is not getting on his horse anytime soon. This is going to be all McCarthy and Biden. They're going to have to fight it out. Now, he may come and ride to the rescue going forward, but at least at this point, we don't expect he's going to. And I think the reason is because he doesn't see an upside for him or the Republican Party to do so at this point. Lester, what needs to happen tomorrow? We're going to have all the players in the room. Apparently, the only ones who matter are President Biden and Speaker McCarthy, exactly as Kevin McCarthy wanted. Yeah. But for this to advance beyond tomorrow, I realize they're not going to have a deal. Both sides need to feel good about this. Kevin McCarthy is going to come out in the driveway uh, outside the West Wing and talk to reporters about this. What's he going to say happen? I think he's going to say that the president has begun negotiations with him about what this deal is ultimately going to look like. I think the president and his spokespeople are going to go out and say, Actually, the president had a very firm line that there needs to be mm -hmm. a debt raise, a debt increase legislation that's clean and doesn't have these spending cuts attached. Yeah. But so I think both sides are going to come out and say they kind of got what they wanted. This may, and hopefully this is the beginning of a process that lasts for two or three weeks and we get to something real substantive that either sets a, a firm date in the fall, kind of suspends the debt limit issue until the fall when mm -hmm. they, can, they can do this in a more thoughtful way, or we actually get some sort of budget deal in the next couple of weeks. What we heard, though, from Mitch McConnell was a, a nod that this is very different from 2011. Right. This is very different because of the makeup of the House of Representatives. He says we're in a situation now in the House of Representatives that is much more reluctant to enter into deal than we had in 2011. So even if McCarthy is willing to have a negotiation, can he get it past his own conference? Well, I wouldn't count Kevin McCarthy out. Let's, let's give him some credit. He got elected speaker under, against some pretty tough odds. He got a debt increase package passed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, people didn't think he could do that either. It turns out he might be a pretty good speaker. And so he may understand exactly what he can get from his conference. There's no, no doubt in my mind, at least, that in order to, to increase the debt ceiling, we're going to need to see at least some of the reforms the Republicans included in their package. I think the devil is going to be in the details. I'm not sure they're going to get the policy issues they want mm -hmm. or the timing of the, the next debt increase, but I, I think mm -hmm. they're going to get some spending cuts. Hey, Jeannie, what's going on here? Is this Mitch McConnell looking across the room at Joe Biden saying, you know what, we're too old for this <laughs> new Republican House to get anything passed here? Or is he just trying to hold his place to be able to swoop in at the last minute, take credit for a deal. Yeah, he doesn't want to play this dance one more time with Joe Biden after all these years. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I do think that, again, for, for Mitch McConnell, he, in 2011, saw that the Republicans may lose if he didn't step in. He himself may lose, that it wasn't a winning proposition to keep going. And so he did strike a deal. I think Republicans are feeling, number one, pretty confident that Joe Biden is going to be on the losing end of this and the Democrats. And also, number two, even if he swoops in now, as he said in the Bloomberg piece, he, this is a very different House Republican caucus. Mm -hmm. Is he going to be able to, you know, sort of Joel them into accepting some kind of deal. At this point, he doesn't think so. So what is the benefit to jumping in? Not much. So he's going to let Joe Biden and Kevin McCarthy jump into this fire on their own, and maybe he comes in at the last 11th hour if he sees it as something that he can push through the House caucus or have Kevin McCarthy do. Mm -hmm. Jeannie, are the Republicans winning the narrative in the media yeah, I have been fighting this out with so many of my friends, Anne-Marie, and I know it is, you know, traditional and historic to say that, you know, the president will probably come out okay and the Republicans will lose, but I think I go back to what is, in my, in my understanding, the way this usually pans out. Be presidents benefit when the economy is good. They don't when it's bad. His numbers on the economy are bad, and so this is, in my mind, going to be either an even split or Joe Biden's going to come out the loser on this. So I do think he's going Going to be incentivized now to step forward. Well, we're going to get into those numbers coming up next. Lester and Jeannie will be back with us as we look at the latest polling for President Biden and for the 24 field. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. More voters choosing Donald Trump over Joe Biden for the 2024 presidential election. In the most recent Washington Post ABC News polls just out over the weekend, we welcome back our political panel, Lester Munson and Jeannie Shanzano, to discuss. Jeannie, as our political science professor, I know you're an expert in polling. I want to ask you about some of the numbers here because the headlines are brutal, particularly for Joe Biden. As I read on the terminal, Biden trails Trump as his approval rating hits new low in ABC poll. That's 36 percent, by the way, two weeks after announcing his reelection campaign. This is a sample, though, of roughly 1,000 randomly sampled adults as opposed to registered voters or likely voters. So how much should I read into this on a national level? Yeah, I would urge a note of caution. These are bad numbers for Joe Biden. No other way to look at it. But to your point about the sample here, I looked at the last four polls that came out from they were Emerson, Wall Street Journal, uh, Harvard Harris, and The Economist, YouGov. In all of those polls, which included registered voters sampled versus just U.S. citizens, as they did with the ABC Washington Post, Joe Biden was either ahead or tied in three of those four and within the margin of error, so essentially tied in three, and Trump was ahead by five in the Harris-Harvard. And so much either tighter numbers when you ask registered voters. So my caution is always, as bad as these numbers look, we have to look at polls mm. overall and take an average of those polls, and you have to consider uh, many things, but number one here, the sample. This is not registered voters, so a very different outcome when you ask adults overall. Okay, so maybe, Joe, a grain of salt here. But mm -hmm. what struck me is, is the age issue. People view Biden as 80, way too old to run again, 68%. And it's 44% who think Trump at 76 is too advanced in his years. They're four years apart. Well, I think people see the difference between the two, the two men, right? Joe Biden is not as energetic as Trump is. And yes, Trump is not quite as energetic as he used to be a few years ago, but he presents a more robust figure than President Biden. Is that just because he talks louder? <laughs> maybe, maybe so. And he's, but he, he knows how to behave on TV in a way that, get, that evidently mm. gives people more confidence, at least than Joe Biden does. I mean, I do think it's pretty shocking that 63 percent of Americans in this poll said Joe Biden isn't physically and mentally ready to be president. That, those are alarming numbers. Pretty alarming, uh, certainly as you're, you're vying for re-election here. Uh, the, the hypotheticals for 2024 are pretty interesting, too, not just for Donald Trump, but for Ron DeSantis. Uh, other national polls we've seen, Joe Biden struggles more against DeSantis nationally. He loses to both in this poll. Do you believe it? I, I do. I mean, he's, I think the American people have decided he's too old to be president for another term, mm. and they don't want him to run. This seems like a tremendous opportunity for an ambitious Democrat to me to, to step up and be seen as, you know, the, the person who could step in and be the, the next candidate. I, and I, it, it's a mystery to me why that's not already happening. On the, under the cloud of all of this, a really bad poll, President Biden's going to have this huge debt ceiling meeting on Tuesday, but also, Jeannie, he's going to have Title 42 lifting, and he's sending 1,500 troops to the border. How difficult are these images going to be for a president that a few days after that is getting on a plane and going to the G7 in Hiroshima? Very, very difficult. You know, Henry, I live in New York. We are a sanctuary city, and we have a mayor here who is trying to send some of the 70,000 immigrants that have been sent up from places like Texas to close counties where we live around New York City. And those county officials are fighting back, declaring states of emergency. And that is up in New York. It is far worse down at the border. We expect it could be 12 to 13,000 people trying to cross per day once this thing is lifted. So, this is, you know, crisis at the border, crisis with the economy, which this president is facing as he goes overseas. And just to follow on Lester's point, we're going to see Joe Biden, I mean, Donald Trump, rather, out on CNN in a town hall. Joe Biden needs to get out and talk to the media. He should come talk to you two because he has not been talking to the <laughs> press. Here. Yes, I, th that's my that's my plug. But, you know, he hasn't been talking <laughs> to the press. an interview on Friday. He, the, it, if you can't show energy if you're not talking to the press, and Donald Trump does. So we've got a communications problem here. If, if the administration is out there over the weekend, as, and, and we saw the Homeland Security Secretary saying, oh, no, we've been planning this. It's going to be difficult, but we've been planning for a year and a half for this, and we're ready. That raises expectations at a pretty awkward moment, doesn't it? 
Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I would have said it that way. But I, I do think the border, is, this evidently imminent border crisis, and, and it's probably already begun, is a huge opportunity for the president to show leadership and vigor and energy. Yeah. You know, deploy more troops. Go down there yourself. What if he went himself Supervise on the situation. Don't, don't go off to Japan to, to some meeting. Send your secretary of state or send the vice president. Mm. Show leadership yourself. He has a huge opportunity here to address exactly the issues we saw in that poll that came out this weekend. All right, well, lots more to discuss this week. It's only Monday. Lester Munson and Jeannie Shanzano, thank you so much for joining us. All these stories and more in the Washington edition of the news newsletter on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll do this again tomorrow, right? Yeah. For Anne-Marie Hordern, I'm Joe Matthew. This is Bloomberg.